Peter, I just wanted to bring up, I know I'm cat crazy. My One of my sons tells me, what are you, the crazy cat lady now? <laughs> but Mickey, my male cat, I look at him and I say, Mickey, do you love me, Mickey? Do you love me? I love you, Mickey. I, and it's such, <laughs> such an amazing relationship. But God is like to say, this is, do you love me? Do you love me, Jeff? Do you love me? I love you. I love you. And if you have that love for that creature, just think about how much God loves us, who created that for us and that spirit. And you feel wonderful. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up for ever and ever. There's much people that are all excited about what the Lord did right there. And uh, I think they're thrilled and happy that the Lord took, finally took care of this thing because you remember back in Revelation says, oh Lord, how long dost thou, you know, judge and avenge our blood on them, you know, that uh, gave us right. a difficult time. Yeah, that, that was the fifth seal. The fifth seal that is opened on the book has these saints under the altar calling out for justice. And who are they calling out for? Who's going to give them justice? It's God himself. You know, God from um, is it Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. And it's this lament over all the injustices on earth. And God himself clothes himself in righteousness. He puts on his breastplate, the helmet of salvation, and he intervenes to make things right. It's such a powerful story, reality, that we get to see play out. When you think about God Almighty, it's just mind-blowing. You know, pinch me. Is this real? Is this really happening? And then we go into a realm that's so far beyond. And there's a lot of unknown and uncertainty. And that's what gets us a little bit nervous at times. But if you stay in the word and you live the word, it gives you faith where you can uh, you can almost you could see almost see these these stories and and you have faith to overcome. You believe what Jesus said. And you know, one thing I wanted to share. And I think I've shared it before. You know, some of this stuff could be, they use the word nebulous. It's so big that it's hard to grasp our calmer minds around things. But when, and I never thought about this until recently, but where Jesus said, I will not henceforth drink of the cup of the vine until I dr drink it anew with you in heaven. I mean, that puts the, the face of God the, the, where we, we can wrap our carnal mind around that, drinking wine with Jesus in heaven. It's it's real. It's something you could, so, you know, could you squeeze in and say, Lord, can I drink? I'm not a big wine drinker, 
and I'm not a big alcoholic fan. I mean, I do, I have drunk in, in my in my time in life at different times. But Lord, can I squeeze in with you guys and just sit and just have a little wine and just listen to you? And, you know, it's so like, anyway, maybe you, you understand what I'm saying, Peter. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, no. well, there's a lot of people, I've never really been so much into this myself, but people who really uh, explore the rapture and ecstasy side of Christianity and, and they uh, really get into the spirit and, you know, I've, I haven't had so much in, of those kinds of experiences myself, but I know some people in this life really pursue and achieve some of those experiences of that real far out stuff with the Lord, kind of like what Paul talks about a bit, you know, one, he says like, um, I don't even know if I was uh, in the spirit or not in the spirit, but I knew someone and, and uh, talks about some experience he had. I forget which epistle that's in. Yeah, I hear you. Beautiful. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. All these saints constantly giving the Lord the glory, they're excited about his greatness and his love, his love. I mean, it, it's amazing. Like, you know, me with the animals now, I got these cats. And the love that you have for an animal, I've never really experienced that that much in my life because, I, like I said before, I, I traveled a lot and I couldn't keep an animal around. And you, you look at that animal looking at you in, like, bewilderment, like, trying to figure out, trying to figure me out. I got this cat. He looks at me like, why are you hugging me? Why do you love me so much? Can you imagine that's the way I see it? And I've seen other people on YouTube that love the squirrel or a lamb or, you know, and, you know, I always, I'd like to make a t-shirt, love animals, love God, because he made them for you. And uh, anyways, Look at the people giving God all this honor and praise, and which we do too when we stop and we look and we sit down and we look at God's creation and you get a chance to go, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done. You've done a masterful work beyond words. Anyways, you see that here with these people. They're just excited. Praise the Lord and give him glory right through this whole time here. Oh, yeah. This major recurring theme all through Revelation, just these, these praise, these worship scenes in heaven. These four and 20 elders, I think we first saw them back in chapter four, and they are, keep popping up. You know, these are some very important people, and our, uh, our view of them is they're always worshiping God. They're always, always worshiping God. And the four beasts, these I think the seraphim that are around the throne, the throne. So you know you have the 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 four seraphim, the twenty four elders, and then there's always some big group of people also there praising God. And and this is a really special event here that they're excited about. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So the marriage feast, this is a big deal. This is has been something that we've had in mind from the time Jesus was on earth giving his parables. He's been talking about this. This is a, a huge event in the whole 
uh, end time events that that Jesus has 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 laid out for us from his parables all the way up now. I think we see some of it in the epistles, and 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 now here it is in Revelation, a a real say in the flesh event it's happening now you know in daniel it talks about blessed is he that waiteth i forgot the numbers, the numbers and all that but i think it's a 75 days that some bible teachers attribute that to 75 days of the marriage supper and then after the marriage supper then comes the lord returning with his saints for i believe that's the battle of armageddon but there's that time period that some Bible scholars believe is the 75 days for during the marriage supper. Yeah, lining up Daniel and Revelation, that's a great topic there. How, what do we, does, this, does this help us make sense of some of the numbers and days being given to us in Daniel? And yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Jeff. I think it does. Um, so in, in, in the parables, we have the, the five wise and five foolish virgins, you know, some are ready to go into the marriage supper and some are not. We have the, the Lord who goes out and calls all these people to come to his, his son's marriage feast. And some of them reject him. And so he goes out and calls other people. And then they're the ones who get to come in. Um, is it talking about this marriage feast here in Revelation? I believe so. I believe so. What other marriage supper feast could it be? I yeah. don't. I don't know. I don't know of any other right now. So that's really I'm interesting. I, I guess you know we've always seen those parables talking about salvation, accepting Jesus. You have to do it, or you're not going to make it into God's big party. You know, <laughs> and. Um, yeah. In the case of the of the wise and foolish virgins filling their lamps with oil, um, how does that fit into this? You know, are are who who are the wise and who are the foolish virgins that get to come into the feast or don't? What is what do you make of that? Well, I make of it just like what it says for face value. Uh, another story. What about the guy that came into the feast? Without a wedding garment. That's pretty heavy. Right. Uh, and he, right. it's a severe punishment for, for him. So, like here we just read that the, the, the garments were the righteousness of the saints. So, the, the, the wedding garments are the righteousness. The, the things that the people did, whatever the righteousness is. Believing in Jesus Christ and loving him. It's the greatest righteousness you could have. So, because for all sinners, even Paul said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So, the Lord will put you on that track to righteousness. What is the work of God? This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. And if you believe on him, you're going to do what he says, because he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And his commandments, the first one is to love him. So there it is. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. I guess John is yeah. seeing someone who had also been a, a disciple. No, this is someone who was a fellow a servant saint. and of his brethren. One of the saints. One of the many, many millions of saints. Wow. Sent, sent to do a job. Sent to give a message to his brother on earth. That's a cool interaction there. Between John and one of these departed saints. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Do you have any, any comments on that? What to make of that? So what is prophecy? That's what it comes down to. 
The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Is prophecy prediction? Is prophecy the future? What is prophecy? If it's the future, the testimony of Jesus would be in the future. So what's your thought on that, Peter? Help me. Prophecy meaning like the, the, the revealing of God's will to people about the future, sure, but also about the present. I, I guess um, the spirit of prophecy is a testimony of Jesus. Like, like that's kind of the, the essence of it all. The essence of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, the, the story of Jesus, the gospel, and of course, Jesus's destiny to reign over everything and everyone. I love it. That's it. I like the way you said that. Thank the Lord. Jesus's life in the Gospels is the future, is the, is the way, is where it's at. Wow. Uh, I, I forget which chapter. It might have been chapter 7 or chapter 8, where the angel stands with one foot on the land, one foot in the sea, and he raises his hand and declares that, Time will be no more, and the mystery of God will be finished. So the big reveal, the resurrection, marriage supper, all of that, that's the, the, the mystery of God that the prophets have been speaking about, dreaming about. It's all coming to a conclusion. Yeah, it's the redemption from the Garden of Eden, from the first fall, from the fall of man, getting fixed it, it's all going to be fixed up in god's great plan we're just teeny little teeny little people <laughs> look of god's creation and he's going to make it all good in his great wisdom his great plan magnificent beyond comprehension it's it's the most far out there's nothing else in life that we live that's more far out than this almighty God that created us. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Wow, here comes someone on that white horse again. We we talked about this when we covered the four horsemen in Revelation 6. Uh, someone goes out on a white horse to conquer. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and it's amazing how hung up people get over that white horse thing you know and, and they try to look so much into it and you know try to make some when you could just take it at face value it's the lord on the white horse you know but they try to well it's this and it's, 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 it's this and, and just straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel trying to put more into it than the simplicity that's in it yeah, well, when we did the podcast on Revelation 6, um, I, I linked it to Psalm 45, where it says, I brought this up here, In thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. So here's someone riding with a bow and arrows mentioned in Psalm 45. And that's it, just, it's got to be the, the, the rider on the white horse with the bow in Revelation 6. And I think we're seeing that very same rider now. Here comes Jesus again on the white horse. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean there's those saints That's, again clothed in yeah. linen and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty god 
and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's coming back. This is the Battle of Armageddon. This is the Armageddon. It's not a nuclear war. It's not man general Armageddon or anything like that or some Hollywood movie Armageddon. This is the Lord coming to destroy the wicked and to purge the world according to his pleasure to cleanse it from the wickedness. That's what that is. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. That's a pretty ominous thing happening there. Angel putting out this okay. message, calling all the birds because they need to eat up all this flesh of the people who are going to be killed in this. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So we just got through the war that the beast makes on the harlot, where he destroys the harlot. And, you know, we've talked about this and that, what that could mean, what kind of, uh, what kind of city or country represents unfaithfulness to the Lord and controls the, the commercialism of the world. And as it describes, it reigns over all the world. So, you know, people say, well, could this be Rome, Jerusalem? I've heard people say London. We talked about the sins of, of American Christianity and, you know, uh, their marriage to uh, militarism and commercialization of, of all the products that go around the world. Whatever it is, the beast and his kings go to war against it and the beast annihilates it. So now it's just, I guess, the beast and his armies. What are they going to do now? They, they have like this, a few weeks, I guess, between the time they destroy the whore. And now they're just sitting on the world waiting for their war with the lamb. Is that kind of how things are happening here? They, they get through destroying the harlot. And now they're all turning their power against god himself no it sounds like two judgments one is the judgment of the whore and the other is the judgment of the beast they're both getting judged um well wasn't sodom and gomorrah two cities sodom and gomorrah <laughs> and so the judgment fell on those two places so what i'm saying is that it sounds to me like it's two judgments the judgment of the whore and the judgments of the beast kingdom. Bada bing, bada bang. Right. And remember, the, the, the whore rides on the beast. So uh, the beast has always been there kind of uh, propping up this, this earthly power of false religion and materialism. At some point, um, God uses the beast to annihilate this uh the, the the worldly system it's it's all just wiped out gone now it's just the beast himself and his armies and now it's their turn to get destroyed by the lamb you know peter it's very interesting because right now from what i'm seeing in europe they're shooting themselves in the foot the eu they put these embargoes on russian oil which made them rich but and now they're um they're suffering for it and they're gonna have cold winters it's like the stupidity about it instead of being humble and making friends it, they, they're go they're like destroying themselves you can understand how kingdoms disappeared off the face of the earth and it's kind of a mystery to all these uh great professors how it happened but you could see it happening 
uh, right now. I'm not saying it's going to happen like that, but you can see little bits of it happening uh, in the world today. So um, even this, uh, this World Economic Forum, it's like they're trying to eradicate everything that made them prosperous. So it's like they're getting rid of the, they're trying to get rid of the whore in a way. Uh, and you know, it, 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 of course, it's a failure because, and it's a it's a lie. It's phony. Uh, you know, oh, we're going to go green, and we're going to do all this stuff. But the green is a pollution too. But the Lord, when He does it, He's going to really cleanse the earth from all these environmental problems that we've created. Mankind has has created, which helped them to become rich and prosperous. And it's going to be a big change. It's going to be a big adjustment for those that go through it. Oh, that's a good point. So yeah, in, in hindsight, it's always easy to see the mistakes that civilizations made. Like, why on earth did they do that? Why did they act in such a self-destructive way? But, uh, you know, as it's happening, all, all the big minds get together and make these decisions and um, really plan their own downfall in, in very foolish ways and this battle is over like that it's over almost before it even starts there's not much of a contest here and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and then that worshipped his image these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. There's no messing around here. It's a very sudden cataclysmic end to the beast, the false prophet, and all their armies. It's over. You know, Peter, <clears throat> Uh, some people might look at this and say, well, there's so much bloodshed and, and, and destruction and it could be abhorrent to certain people that are like flower children or real tender and it could be very depressing and discouraging for them, which is understandable. <clears throat> but if you think about just going back to World War I, not counting the Spanish-American War and all the different wars that have been fought throughout history, but just starting at World War One, and then World War Two, and the wars up from that time till now. How many thousands and millions and of young, healthy, strong, beautiful young men destroyed for what? For what? What's changed that is really? worth dying for pride political beliefs well this is a war coming up that's really going to be a righteous war to destroy all that other stuff and it's a shame how people get duped or forced into fighting wars a lot of people don't want to go they want to be draft dodgers like in the Vietnam War, hell no, we won't go. And they didn't want to go. And a lot of people fled to Canada or whatever. But it was a terrible time. And it's a terrible time now for boys in Ukraine and Russia. People that probably were in the bars together having fun and were friends. How they turned just like the American Civil War. Families torn apart. Well... <clears throat> part of the history of mankind man yeah i i don't think any of these wars are in any way connected to the will of god certainly not the plan certainly not what god made everything for and i i would say any one of these wars could have and should have been avoided <laughs> at any and all cost and we would have been better off for it um Interestingly, here it says about the the one on the white horse, in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So, you know, if if Jesus decides he has to do it this way, I'm going to, you know, trust his judgment on it. And 
I, I mean, who knows how it ultimately turns out? You know, I, I don't think he, again, he didn't create this world. He didn't create these people so that they could rise up against him and be destroyed. That wasn't his purpose. If he has to do it, he's going to do it. And I think we know that he's going to um, take every measure possible to save as many people as possible. And hey, if there's some big surprises and things turn out better, well, praise the Lord. But uh, this is the revelation that he gave to John and gave to the church of, of how things are going to turn out. So I think, you know, we have to expect that something like this is going to happen and it's going to be for the right reasons. Yes. And I, I think it's it's really moving at a very fast pace now. And people are going to have to make choices. Daniel chapter 12. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever.